Every 38 seconds, someone in the U.S. attempts suicide. When many people think of depression, they think of it as something people claim to have to get attention from others. Although it may seem like that, it's actually very far from it. Depression can occur when the chemicals in the brain are unbalanced, when someone has the genetics for it, or when exposed to heavy medication or alcohol. Depression is not something someone can simply get over or smile through. Depression is a serious disease that causes thousands of people to kill and harm themselves each year. According to a recent study, around 10% or 19 million Americans per year are affected by depression. 21% of women and 12% of men who live here will have depression at one point in their lives. Along with unbalanced brain chemicals, genetic characteristics, and exposure to heavy medication or alcohol, depression can also occur due to stress, grief, or changes in hormone levels. This explains why most cases of depression are in teens ages 13 through 18. You probably know someone with depression because one in five teens are diagnosed with a mental illness. Along with depression, this also includes anorexia, bulimia, bipolar disorder, anxiety, and schizophrenia. Depression can also cause people to want to hurt themselves. When many people, since many kids, teens, adults, hide the fact that they self-harm from others, it's nearly impossible to get an accurate record. The number of known self-harm cases in the world is 13%. When many people think of self-harm, they think of it as cutting. There are many other tactics that people use when they're trying to hurt themselves. This includes burning, hair pulling, scratching, carving, punching objects, and interfering with healing. You may see a self-harmer as an emo freak, but they think that they deserve all the pain. Many actually say that it takes away the pain and brings them relief. Just like gambling or alcohol, self-harm is an addiction, and once you start, it's very hard to stop. Many actually try to stop, but they can't because they need it like they need oxygen. Suicide is a permanent solution to a temporary problem that many people who deal with depression think is the only way to finally be happy again. Suicide rate in the U.S. is 10.1% per 100,000 people. This may seem like a very high number, but South Korea passes all other countries up with a suicide rate of 24.7% per 100,000 people. Two thirds of people who die by suicide were depressed at their time of death. The Golden Gate Bridge is a really popular place for suicide with over 2,000 people jumping to their deaths since its opening. Many people die on impact, but the 1% who haven't have immediately regretted it the moment that their hands left the rail. They realized that their problems weren't permanent and that they could be solved. Many people see suicide as a joke, but it's not and it shouldn't be treated like one. In conclusion, depression isn't something people can help. It takes over the victim's brain and makes it hard to function. They feel hopeless and worthless. People who are depressed cannot change the way their brains are and the way that they function. Depression, self-harm, and other mental illnesses shouldn't be treated as a choice because the victim did not choose to live a life of pain and suffering. I, who here likes rap, fighting, history, revolution, or even hip hop songs? If you thought one of those things applied to you, then Hamilton is right up your alley. It has all those things and more. Today I will be telling you why Hamilton the musical you and giving you proof why you should go see it. Hamilton started out as a biography. Lynn Miranda, not only the producer, writer, and lyricist, but, the, but Alexander Hamilton in the production was captivated by the life of Alexander Hamilton. Born out of wedlock, raised in poverty and destruction, <coughs> abandoned by his father, orphaned by his mother at an early age. Then his adult life. Oh, then his adult life was even more interesting. He became America's first treasury secretary. And then he got the dubious distinct distinction of being at the center of the nation's first political sex scandal. Uh, Hamilton got amazing reviews and people were loving it on social media. The average critic rating was 9.68 out of 10. That is a lot more than his contemporaries. Terry Teachout from the Wall Street Journal said, Hamilton is the most exciting musical of the decade. It is 
sensationally potent and theatrically vital, it is plugged straight into the wall socket of contemporary music. This show makes me feel hopeful for the future of musical theater. I give it a 10 out of 10. Some, well, some people think of musicals as all singing, no action, or specifically one type of music. Well, I'm here to tell you that Hamilton has rap and hip hop and scandal while still teaching us the factual information about what actually happened in his life and how he affected other people. So the next time you hear the name Hamilton, think of something that you can connect to. Very nice. Imagine a company grossing over $12 billion, not paying their employees a single dime. What if I told you that company exists? It does. The National Collegiate Athletic Association, or better known, the NCAA. Student athletes bring in millions and millions of dollars to their respective universities in the NCAA, but they don't see a single cent of that in return. The NCAA signed a contract with CBS Left Turner Sports for $10.8 billion to be the television host of March Madness through 2024. Yet, players playing those games, they don't see a single dime. They also signed a contract with ESPN for $500 million, giving them the broadcasting rights of the college football playoff. Collegiate sports is based off amateurism. Why, you say? Well, they don't pay athletes for the sole reason because they're amateurs. But being an amateur isn't being paid. How can you just say something's true? Because it's true and it gives no reasoning. So I'm just, not only do students not have money, but they don't have food. They're only allotted a certain number of hours to be in school cafes. Some students say they go to bed hungry. Arian Foster and his teammates at Tennessee once said, and I quote, we're gonna do something crazy, rub a bank or some shit. So their coach threw them a taco party after a win, which is against NCAA policy. He was suspended three games for feeding his players. If I told you the star English student was gonna write a book and have it published, would you be all up in arms saying, oh, that's not fair, you shouldn't be able to make money off that? You wouldn't, because it's stupid. Just like the phrase student athlete. If students miss weeks, sometimes months of school, they're for their, for their athletic events. They're there because of their athletic ability, just like a star math student is there for their smarts. They're there because they're great at their field and they're there for what they're good at. So I ask you, are you going to help a national organization pull off the biggest fraudulent scandal on, on the planet? Or are you going to help me put them in their place? $4.58 million is the average salary of an NBA athlete. I remember growing up, I wanted to be an NBA athlete so I could dunk and do cool tricks, but now it seems like uh, people want to be athletes just to get money. It almost seems like winning a championship has become second priority uh, now. Money has turned sports into a multi-million dollar business. So I think there should be a salary cap in sports because when athletes are competing to get paid the highest amount of money, it takes away from actually playing the sport. With a salary cap, no man or woman competing in the same league could get paid higher than the other. Now this could bring about some problems seeing that if one athlete was much better than the other. They might still get paid the same, uh, but then uh, they might still get paid the same, uh, but then it would put more focus back on winning a championship. Uh, so, so here the graph of what I think might be a suitable amount for each league. Of course, this is just an average salary, so teams would have to balance how much they play uh, the good and the bad players. Uh, so if leagues are if leagues are saving all, or if athletes aren't getting paid as much and leagues are saving all this money, where could all, where could all the extra money go? Uh, here are a few options I've come up with. You could donate to organizations that help with people who need clothes, food, or shelter, or donate to organizations that help kids with disabilities, or any charity like that. I think this would bring a lot of good publicity to the sport. Uh, because then people, more people would want to watch the sport and buy different products because they would know a portion of their money is going to charity. So again, with the salary cap, uh, there should be a salary cap because right now money is taking away from the sports and turning it into something it shouldn't be. Uh, and by doing
only leftover money as much to, as one to two million dollars, I think leaks could do a lot of good in the community. So next time someone or someone tells you they want to play sports to get lots of money, remember to tell them that it's not always about the money. League of Legends is a video game. You might be wondering why I'm talking about video games, but that's not it. Video, uh, this game, League of Legends, teaches strategy. First, let me give you a basic idea of the game. League of Legends is a MOBA, multiplayer online battle arena, with three to five people on a team depending on what map you play on. There are three maps, a, a three lane five versus five map, a one lane five versus five map, and a two lane three versus three map. In these games, there are positions that you play. Uh, there's an ADC, attack, take damage, carry, who usually it gets help from another person to support. There's a mid laner who does magic damage, and a top laner who has a lot of HP and armor. There's also a jungler who jumps from lane to lane, helping, helping the other people on its team. Uh, to win the game, you have to destroy the Nexus. The, ne the Nexus gives the players the power over, over their champions, and destroying it will allow you to win the game. There are 123 champions in League of Legends that, with their own set of abilities and powers to choose from. In the game, there are items that you can buy to boost your abilities and powers throughout the game. League of Legends teaches strategy because there are 27 million people play it daily and 67 million people play it monthly. This is more than the amount of people who live in the UK. Uh, over the time, <coughs> over the time that you play the game, you have to get to know your team and decide how the rest of the game should be played out. If you're winning, you want to play aggressive, so then it's harder for the other team to catch up. And if you're losing, you want to play defense, defensively, so then there is a way so you can catch up. In the game, there are team fights, and in these team fights, in, and in the team fights, you, uh, and whoever wins the team fights, you get a gets a lot of money and gets objectives such as defensive powers, where you even can win the game. So in League of Legends, it's important to have strategy because uh, teamwork because you can. Because if you don't, you lose the game, and it'll be one side. So in conclusion, it's important to have teamwork in League of Legends because if you, the, the League of Legends teaches teamwork because there, because you barely play a game with the same person twice, and there are so many champions to choose from that there that there is such a variety in the game. With this, you have to change the way you play the game every time, making it making you making it harder. Well, making you better at teamwork and strategy. After a lifetime in silence and darkness, to be deaf is a greater affliction than to be blind. When you lose your eyesight, lose contact with women. When you lose your hearing, lose contact with people. Helen Keller. No, I know about that. You see, everyone has a sound reception threshold, or SRT for short. How SRT is measured is simple. Zero decibels is the quietest noise imaginable, and 120 decibels is the loudest. The average person's SRT is 0 to 20 decibels, meaning they can hear those quieter sounds. My SRT is 40. So, after getting hearing aids, I can not only hear better, but have a different perception on life. Before I got hearing aids, there was something I couldn't hear. Birds, the microwave, and oven beeping, and constant. People thought I wasn't listening to them, and were always perceiving what they had already said and heard several times. So when I finally put my hearing aids in, I could tell the difference. Even only 80% of what the average person should hear, every noise seemed to pound in my head like a hammer. But the first thing I heard when I walked out of my audiologist building that day was birds. And I guess you could say that hearing some birds in a parking lot was the turning point in my life, the peak of my existence as I know it today. It was the start of new understanding. I could no longer tell where sounds were coming from, so I learned. What paper being crinkled sounded like, what opening a door sounded like. Having hearing aids blesses multiple reactions to alcohol experience. There's been the good thing of hearing aids. I can hear lessons in school. I can finally hear those birds, the microwave beep, the consonant, the oven go off, and so much more. But there's also the bad. They're expensive. $3,000 is bad. And when they're not bad, they're okay. In addition, it took quite a few um, tries for the hearing aids to work for me. I had to change the tube tubing, find the right size, try different cases, use different cleaners, and adjust the sound. But I have learned from my experience. First, understand your limits. I know that as of right now, I can't turn the volume up on my hearing aids, even if it means I'm still below average. Oh, this could relate to anyone for anything. Sports and academics, for example. Know when you've worked your hardest and don't overdo it. You could end up sick or stressed. The second thing I learned was... Finding solutions. Oh, to always find solutions.
things that work for you. I had to change my tubing multiple times until I found what's most comfortable. I had to change the tubing. I had to see different sizes. Oh, I had to see different sizes and learn the differences between the styles until I found what worked for me. Everyone should choose what works for them. So if you have a problem, find a solution. Super slut to bring down me, except I was still horse fishing. No air conditioning, no breeze. Nothing but a hot day and running towards a new teacher. The shorts up to my middle finger and suitable for school. According to my school, they are not acceptable. Most girls got dressed good for wearing school appropriate shorts on a New Year's Eve day. Last year, 200 students at Staten Island High School were reportedly given detention for wearing shorts and tank tops during temperatures in high 80s, and 90% of whom were female. Many students and organizations feel that dress code bans children with religious or political messages on an infringe of students' freedom of speech. Middle school years, <coughs> students like to experiment with fashion. They are also at that stage of developing personal style. It reduces their freedom to express personal, political, and religious views. Um, according to research, 19% of public schools require uniforms and 57% of public schools enforce a strict dress code. The students who follow a strict dress code are limited in expression. And some schools even prohibit clothing with slogans and certain hairstyles. All dress code does is single a student and humiliate her because her shorts are barely below her fingertips, which is very unacceptable and disturbing. Dress code is designed to be sexist because it is mainly targeting females. It even reinforces the rape culture. Dress code tells girls that their bodies are inherently sexual and not entitled to human decency and respect unless they cover it up which is slut shaming and objectifying. It gives boys permission to disrespect girls unless they cover up. A friend and I decided to write a, our principal a letter. We wanted to change dress code for the incoming seventh and eighth graders. Even though we won't be here next year, we still wanted to do something about it. If we don't do anything now, it will become a bigger problem in the long run. You should always stand up for what you believe in as long as you do it in a respectful way. The NHL has a wide variety of players from ages 17 to 43 and from places all around the world. But of all the people who put in the hard work and effort to make it to the NHL, which are the most talented? Many can debate who the most talented are and have many good reasons to back it up. But today I'll be talking to you about who I think the most talented are and why they deserve this position. So if you are not familiar with hockey, it's a game with six different positions. The positions are center, right wing, left wing, left defenseman, right defenseman, and goaltender. The center, right wing, and left wing are all positions called forward. The right defenseman and left defenseman are positions called defense. Each position has their own job to do on the ice to help the team run smoothly. For the forward position, I chose Sidney Crosby. Sidney Crosby was drafted first overall to the Pittsburgh Penguins in 2005. He has won one Stanley Cup and entered the NHL at the age of 17. To think about how, how young that is, imagine in three to four years, you and I could be in the NHL making $3 million. Then at the age of 20, he took the league by surprise and led the league in total points. But because of his injuries, he has been doubted to be the best NHL player, but truly is an amazing talent of the NHL. For the defensive position, I chose Duncan Keith. Duncan Keith was drafted 54th overall to the Chicago Blackhawks in 2002. He has won three Stanley Cups with the Chicago Blackhawks. He also has very long-lasting stamina. He was once tested and had a much larger lung capacity than the average human. This benefits to making him the most valuable player in the NHL. For the goaltender position, I chose Carey Price. Carey Price was drafted fifth overall to the Montreal Canadiens in 2005. He has not won a Stanley Cup, but is getting closer and closer to the task every year. He has he has been recognized as the best player by winning the Hart Memorial, which is the most valuable player in the NHL. Carey Price, definitely... Price has definitely proven he is the best NHL goaltender. All these players, all these players are some amazing. All these players are some amazing athletes that have not just taken the NHL by surprise, but taken the world by surprise. So next time you watch a hockey game, remember to think that all the players on the ice are working as hard as they can to be as skilled as the players I just mentioned. Nice. Everyone witnesses something that changes their life. Sometimes for the worse, and <coughs> sometimes for the best. Well, now, I know what you're thinking, then I'm probably just gonna talk about some depressing story. Well, 
Actually, you're wrong. I'm going to be talking about choir and the positive effects it can have on you, just like it did on me. I started choir when I was in the third grade, and I thought I could, I could escape from all the negativity of the world. With all the positive people and all the positive energy, I felt like I was at home. Singing means so much to me, and nobody can ever take it away. I have so much passion. I have so much passion, and I hope you can see how much it means to me. When I was singing with the group, I felt like I belonged to something and like I was accepted. At the time, all of my friends were involved with something, but I wasn't, be it sports, art, etc. I was alone and I wanted something to be a part of. So then I thought, why not try something musical? I've always loved singing and Kelly Clarkson was my idol. So that's when my life changed forever. Music has so many effects on somebody that I, don't, I only have time to sing with you. Since music is often. Since music is often a social activity, making music brings us together. A group of people in a choir scenario need to come together, learn all the different voice parts as notes, and come together and solve their problems, and then celebrate. Group singing, for those who have done it, is most exhilarating and, the most trans and so transformative. It takes something incredibly intimate, something that begins inside of you, shares it with a room full of people, and comes back as even something more thrilling, harmony. The fact of singing makes a person in a generally more happier mood. Music is so powerful and is really life-changing. As we're all going into high school in a few short months, there are, actually there are actually certain graduation credits that you need to make in order to graduate in 2020. Half of a credit needs to be in fine arts. The five main fine arts are painting, sculpture, architecture, music, and performing arts, including dancing and poet, including dancing and theater. With choir, with choir being music, with choir being music, you can take it for a semester, and if you like it, you can take it for your whole high school career. Now, don't feel like I'm forcing you to do anything that you don't want to. And I do realize that choir isn't for everybody, so don't feel like I'm here to knock on you if you don't participate in any kind of music. Everyone has their different extracurricular outlets. Maybe it's sports, for example, sports. In our society, sports is such a big push, and I just want to bring music back into the social status. In conclusion, choir means so much to me and I hope that you can take something from me and use it in a time of distress. If you keep an open mind, I hope I can share a passion of music with you. I have a very common fear, and this fear haunts me every day, but I know I have it, and it makes saying it claustrophobia. Let me tell you a story. When I was younger, I locked myself in a box. Well, I put myself in a box. I couldn't get out. After 15 minutes, I finally got out of the box. That night, I had a, I had a dream about Blob. No matter how far I ran, it would always come around me and trap me. But I still have this nightmare, just not as often. And the box is the reason why I have this fear. And even now, I'm still afraid of caves, elevators, I've been in them for too long, and many other things. Well, this fear is a fear of tight spaces, tight or small spaces. And whoever has this problem probably already knows this. And this fear is common. Definition. The definition of claustrophobia is a fear, small or tight spaces. Like I said before. But it is also like common for people who like have experienced traumas, like like being in tight spaces for too long or like being in, around too many people at one time. And so I think people should know about this so then they know how to react to it if this ever happens near them, like to anyone around them. The first thing that you'll notice if they start breathing heavily and freaking out. And so the first thing you should do is identify what's happening inside your head. And then after that, you just walk up to them and start comforting them. Start telling them to calm down and take deep breaths. Because those actually really help if you tell them to calm down. And then after that, tell them to think about something else. Once they're out of the area, stay with them a little longer. Because they'll need a little more comforting. And um, the side of, yeah, some effects of claustrophobia are sweating, heavy breathing, accelerated heart rate, dizziness, and dry mouth. Some places that could, this could happen are in caves, elevators, tight hallways, bathrooms if it's really severe, 
and more. This happened to me when I went to when I went on vacation to Wonderland Cave last year. After a little bit of being there, I started to experience the effects. And some people will think you're pulling a prank or faking it, and they won't help stab me like my sister. And so to overcome this fear. To overcome this fear is to take it up with a psychologist or to or to experience a lot of the fear at once. And so far I haven't done either. If you have if you don't have the fear and you experience a lot of like like tightness or something like that, like around you, then you could gain the fear. And if you like if you have like a very small amount of it, then if you take it up with a psychologist then it'll increase it or it could decrease it. And so now that you know one of the many fears, yeah, now that you know one of the many fears, how will you overcome your other fears? I was in the middle of a heated battle, trapped behind a tall, inflatable bunker. My team was counting on me. This is where all those hours of practice had to pay off. This is exactly what I thought when I hung the flag for our team's victory in a 3v1 situation. This was my first tournament. It was also the highlight of the tournament when I closed out the other team with players twice my age outnumbering me three to one. Paintball is the best sport I have ever played. Some people think that paintball isn't a sport. I'm here to tell you that it is. First of all, there are pro. There are pro, semi-pro, and even college leagues. There are also many paintball tournaments around the world. For example, the Millennium Cup is a tournament held in Europe every, every year with the top players from around the world. Another tournament is World Cup. This tournament is held every single year. It's the biggest paintball tournament because it doesn't only host uh, pro divisions, but every single division. It is like like the Super Bowl of paintball. Another aspect you must take into consideration is paintball being a very physical sport. Um, paintball. It really pushes the boundary. It really pushes the boundary of the term blood, sweat, and tears. It's so physical and demanding because the whole time you are always moving with a lot of weight on your back and heavy gun in your hands. It takes a lot of endurance. It takes a lot of endurance to play paintball. It's also a very strategic sport. I like to say it's like a game of chess when you are... Um, you have to get better. To, if you practice and get better at the sport, then you can decide if you want to be the pawn or the queen. Overall. Overall, paintball is a great sport, and I would recommend everybody to play it. Um, if it doesn't sound like your cup of tea, then at least you know more about it for when one of your friends forces you to play it and you get older. Um, we are lucky enough. We are lucky enough to... Uh, paintball can be a very expensive sport, but we are lucky enough to have a place near us that is an alternative to paintball. Uh, Reballing at Westmont Yard is like paintball, but it uses uh, rubber balls that are reusable, so it costs a lot less. Uh, from 5.30 to 8 p.m. only on Fridays, you can go to Westmont Yard and experience paintball, or reball firsthand. It's only $25, so it gives you the best experience for you best bang for your buck. Um, I hope that all of you guys enjoy it and try to play it. And try to get out of here. Thanks. Okay. Okay. Alex, I'm imagining yourself here at Perry. You're sitting in the crowd at a school event or school game or sporting event. Now open your eyes and raise your hand if you imagine that game at a male or a boys game you've ever there are over 400,000 high school cheerleaders in the U.S. The majority of them cheer for male athletic teams. Yet, they don't cheer for female athletic teams. Many people don't realize the inequality and sexism towards girls, specifically that affects the players and the team's self-esteem. 
hopefully today you can learn something new and the benefits of having cheerleaders for both genders. A majority of the student body in high schools and middle schools don't even attend games or sporting events, much less the female athletic team. Many people are, may even be oblivious to the fact that girls need the same amount of support as boys and how much that really affects players and athletes. Even friends? Even friends may not realize they haven't been supporting each other, whether it's through games or competition. It is common. It is common that the amount of stress and anxiety that athletes have to overcome is completely overlooked. What many people don't realize is without a crowd of fans or supporters, um, without a crowd of fans or supporters, it can actually affect the outcome of games. By encouraging others to do well, it may boost their self-esteem and help them feel more empowered so that they may play and compete much better. Although some girls, although some girls say that they wouldn't want to cheer for other girls, this is taken as one of the main reasons for gender inequality for cheerleaders. Without supporters from both genders being willing to stand up for what's right, these things can be completely ignored. It is important that we find equality within all aspects of life, including education and school. As as acceptance of as acceptance of racial equality increases, this does not give boys a right to take having an audience or supporter or cheerleaders at a game for granted. Some people may even be scared to stand up for their rights or equality, but uh, as more and more bystanders come forth, hopefully we can find equality within gender, race, culture, religion, or any other aspect of life that differentiates one person from another. And we can find equality between both genders. Have you ever wondered how athletes are improving so rapidly? Well, the winner of the 2012 Olympics ran the marathon in two hours and six minutes. If you had been racing against the winner of the 1904 Olympic marathon, you would have nearly won by an hour and a half. So, why is this? In 1936, Jesse Owens held the world record for the 100 meter dash. If you had been racing against Usain Bolt, the winner of the 2012 Olympic 100 meter dash, you would have nearly lost by 14 feet. Bolt started by propelling himself out of blocks down a specially fabricated carpet designed to allow him to go as fast as possible. On the other hand, Jesse Owens ran on cinders, which is the ash from burn wood. Cinders took far more energy from his legs as he ran than a new track would. Also, rather than using blocks, Owens used a gardening trowel getting holes through the cinders to start from. Studies show that if they had both been running on the same track, Owens would have only lost by one stride rather than 14 feet. That's the difference track technology has made over the years. In 1954, Roger Bannister was the first person to run under a four minute mile. As of the end of 2013, 1,314 men had done this. Just like Owens, Roger Bannister ran on soft cinders. Studies, studies show that it is 1.5% slower to run on cinders than a synthetic track. Um, if you apply the 1.5% slowdown conversion to the 1,314 men that had run under a four minute mile, this is what happens. Only 530 are left. Not only is technology improving greatly in sports, but people are now training more intelligently than ever before. Kids are now training at a professional level. Technology, technology. Technology has made a difference in every sport, from faster skis to lighter shoes to even the aerodynamics of a Formula One car. Not only is technology. Not only are people improving. Not only are people improving, but technology is greater than ever before. I don't want to die, I am dying, and I want to die on my own terms. That is a quote from 29-year-old Brittany Mayer. Brittany had a six-month prognosis and an aggressive return of brain cancer. She wanted the right to die before her disease had killed her, and while fighting for her rights, she gave dying with dignity a lot of public attention. After many trips to court and dozens of interviews, Brittany moved to Oregon and died peacefully on her own terms. This is just one of the many stories about people wanting the right to die. The right to die, by definition, is advocating the right to refuse extraordinary measures intended to prolong someone's life when they are terminally ill. Basically meaning that people can refuse treatment or request a different medication in which to peacefully die. This would save, this would save them from the excruciating side effects of medication which is deter deteriorating their life. I believe that people should have the right to die and I think that it is important for everyone to know what the right to die is and to form an opinion on the issue. The right, people should have the right to die for many, many reasons. First of all, no one should be able to tell you that you have to stay alive in a horrible condition of life. It isn't right for these people to stay alive in utter pain and torture and 
until that time comes. It would be so much. It better. would be so much better for these people to die before before they get to the before point before they get to the point of death. If people have the right to die, they could die with their family members by their side. This would also leave their families with a great remembrance of them before they get to the point of death. I know from experience that it is hard to see a family member suffer and no one should have to go through that. With the right to die, no one has to see their family member suffer. As of now, the right to die is legal in, Cal in a few European countries, Colombia, and six American states, being Oregon, Montana, California, Vermont, and some parts of New Mexico. <clears throat> in order to qualify for the medication, you must be 18 years old or older, be a resident in one of the territories that allow the medication, have a six months or less prognosis, meaning six months or less to live, and be mentally, and be mentally competent. competent and able to make decisions on your own. You may think that nothing about this concerns you, but it's more relevant than you might think. What you should do now is talk. Talk about dying with dignity and bring awareness to this topic. So be smart, be strong, be proud, and live honorably. But most importantly, live with dignity and die with it too. This thought of it can sometimes be unsettling, but in actuality, it can help millions of women all around the world. Almost 50% of pregnancies are unintended, and nearly 21% end in abortions. If women feel that they are not ready or stable enough to have a child, they should be able to have an abortion. Women are considered a minority group because the men have more privileges over them. For example, women have to work much harder just to get paid the same as men. Because of this, women shouldn't need to feel that they are any extra pressure put on them. If women want an abortion, they should definitely be able to do it. 18% out of the 21% of people who have abortions are teenagers aged between 15 and 17 years old. These girls may not have enough time to have a child because of their school and other curricular activities. They're still trying to figure out what they want to do in the future and having a child might interfere with this. Others say they aren't mature or responsible enough. Some just simply can't afford raising a child. Having a child from birth until they're 18 costs about $245,340 altogether on average. This is not including extracurricular activities. That is a lot of money that not everybody has. 5% of women have abortions because they've been raped. This is a very traumatic time for these girls and going through it through pregnancy may be a constant reminder of the terrible thing that happened to them. Also, imagine how the child might feel if they found out what happened and how they might react to this. 5% may seem like a small number, but that is because most people who have been sexually assaulted don't tell anyone. That 5% are brave young women who have had the courage to step up and say something about what happened to them. Most of these girls are college students who should stay focused on their school and future career life. If they are willing to leave school to become a mother, that should also be up to them. Moving on to a larger problem, overpopulation. Currently, the world's population is just over 7 billion people. If we want to have enough space and resources for everyone, 10 billion people would be the max. The world's population is continuously growing, and when it reaches 10 million, we won't have enough of these things. Abortion can help in the future by reducing birth rate and preventing the world from overpopulating. Although adoption is always an option, someone, some women just feel more comfortable with having an abortion. If women feel they are not ready or stable enough for this new responsibility, responsibility in their life, they should definitely be able to have a child. So don't bring women down just because they are doing what they believe is best for them. Oh my goodness, oh my goodness. Today is the day, I can't wait. I've waited all week for this day. Guess what everybody, I'm going to the zoo. Every zoo's impact is to make a difference for both the animals and the people. The whole point of having a zoo is to educate the public on the importance of conservation and saving endangered animals. The goal, the goal of Brookfield Zoo is to connect people with wildlife and nature. After going to the zoo so many times, I've learned that it isn't just about seeing me and exotic animals. It's about having a real connection with them. To understand. To understand how these animals feel, everyone close your eyes. Imagine you and the other cheetahs in the room are the last cheetahs in the world. As a cheetah, you wouldn't be able to do anything to help you and your friends. 
How does this make you feel? Open your eyes. As animals, they can't do anything to help them in their fence, but as people, we can. The Post Field Zoo has many different conservation programs and partners with an organization called 96 Elephants, which stops the illegal hunting of elephants and the buying and selling of their ivory tusks. important to me because I feel that animals in captivity is an okay thing. Many people disagree with that, but I, uh, I think that it's better for animals in captivity because uh, the animals in captivity continuously uh, sustain their population by captive breeding in a safe environment uh, away from the dangers of poachers and predators. Without showing the visitor. Without showing the visitor. The importance of uh, animals. No one would know. No one would know how much danger these animals are really in. Many zoos encourage. Many zoos encourage their visitors to go and share with the share the, edu the information that they learn to others when they leave the zoo. This way, more people can come and visit and help protect these animals. The people save the animals. We are their blessing. Crazy, free. These are just a few of the things people think of when they hear schizophrenic, anorexic, depressed. This needs to change. Learning about mental illnesses is important because it is undermined in society due to lack of awareness, improper diagnosis, and people's negative perception of those who are medicated. Emotional symptoms of mental illnesses can be a variety of things and can be very hard to notice. Most commonly, we will see changes in mood, erratic thinking, and impulsive behavior. A lot of times, people don't realize they have a mental illness, so it can be hard for anyone else to notice either. This makes it especially difficult to diagnose children because changes in mood, erratic thinking, and impulsive behavior are typically viewed as normal traits of adolescents. Children don't know what mental illnesses feel like, therefore they sometimes do not realize they even have a mental illness, and they don't get the help they need. Addressing the possibility of having a mental illness can be scary, so reaching out to a school counselor or a peer can be a good first step. Mental illness is much more prominent in children 